Uh, so uh, this is our courageous uh, song that we sing every Sunday morning as we approach Sunday, Sunday school and the start Sunday school. Page 39 in our supplemental book, I Shall Not Be Blue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those of you who have it, let us all sing. I'm going to sing the first, second, and the third stanza. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchor in Jehovah, I shall not be moved just like a tree. It's
Give us some encouraging words before we get started. Brother Noah. All right. Thank you for your love and your leadership. Right. Both you and Brother Ruben. We appreciate your leadership as the elders here before you. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And we're going to be talking about the second coming of Christ once again. And it's because we have so much in the Bible about it. And if you miss some scripture about it, you'll come to the wrong conclusion. So we want to take our time with the topic accordingly. But how is everybody tonight? All right. Well, glad to see you, of course. It always makes my day to spend time with you and fellowship with you and reasoning the scriptures together. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15, one of my favorite passages of scripture, one of the most uh, descriptive of what's going to happen at the end of days, that day when Jesus comes back also known as the second coming of Christ. Have anybody ever done a real in-depth study of Revelation chapter 20? So if you want to know about heaven and hell, Revelation 20 and 21, though that's exactly where you go and how God really describes it. So before we do that, let's read through it, and then we're going to start breaking it down uh, from there. So somebody read uh, Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15. Now remember the context, this is the Apostle John. And so he's having an apocalyptic vision. And of course it's recorded in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. So he's seeing, or describing, I should say, probably a better way of saying it, the last day. Okay, so he's describing the judgment day in symbolism to us here. All right, somebody go ahead and read that. Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the, face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their work. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right, so I thank God for my wonderful wife who read that for us then eloquently. Now let's break this down of what God is saying. Are you noticing something uh, before we get going? Like all the other passages of scriptures we've studied about the second coming, that last day, the judgment day, however you want to call it, you, do you recognize some common things? Anything common that stick out to you? Because every time you talk about the second coming out of the Bible, there's certain things that's going to keep repeating itself. Have you noticed anything yet? Think about heaven and think about the, the earth and the sky called the heavens here. What's going to happen to them? Yeah. They will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Right. And so every time God talks about those two elements, what does he say is going to happen to them in the end? Right. They're going to be gone. Right? So again, that kills that left behind book and the rapture and all that kind of stuff because there's going to be nowhere for anybody to be living. When Christ comes back, right? right? When Christ comes back, that's why God calls it in the singular. Anytime you see God talking about the last day, he calls it what? The day of the Lord. He never calls it the days, plural, of the Lord. He always says what? The day, day meaning what? The end. Okay? Not the end of existence, but the end of this earthly existence, right? Because all mankind is going to live again. Whether we're evil or we're good, we're going to be immortal. It just depends on what quality of life you want. After you die and after the judgment day comes is what you're determining while you're still here on this earth right now, right? That's the difference between being what? Saved and unsaved, right? Going to eternal life or eternal punishment, right? There's only two directions you're going to go, right? There's going to be one or the other, right? Because there's going to be no probation period. There's no, no get it right a second time. You know, all that kind of stuff. When Christ comes back, when he comes back, he's coming back for good. 
and it's going to be end of this existence for what? Good, right? Never to come back again. All right. And so what I'm saying at saying that for is this reason. When you start getting outside of those principles, you're starting to get outside of the Bible, right? And you're starting to make up your own thing. You're starting to get up into man-made stuff because we serve a God that don't lie, right? And if he, if he doesn't lie, that means he cannot contradict himself in his own word. So if something sounds like it's contradictory, keep studying it. Study other passages of scripture on the same topic, and then you'll come to the what? Truth at that point, okay? Don't start calling God a liar. Don't start saying the word of God is, is false and all that kind of stuff. It means you have misunderstood something, taken something out of context, or have not interpreted in light of other scriptures that talk about the same thing. Does that make sense to you? These are just tips as you study the Bible, not just on this topic, but any topic you come into in the Word of God. Okay, makes sense to you? All right. So again, you start getting out outside of these basic principles that we're learning from the scriptures themselves, that stuff is man-made. And it needs to be what? Discarded. Because it's not the truth. Okay? All right, any questions or comments so far? I'm just kind of getting warmed up. All right. Let's move on then. And let's start breaking it down then. All right. What have we learned so far from Revelation 20, verse number, number 15? We learn, of course, that Jesus is the one sitting on the great throne. Right. Now, notice in Revelation 20, he wasn't identified. Right? He didn't say specifically Jesus, did he? Right. But you know it's Jesus. Why? Because, <coughs> excuse me, you know that because you studied other passages. Right. Remember what we talked about in the introduction? When you study other passages of scripture, it identifies who is the one sitting on the throne, right? right. And we go to several passages of scripture to tell you that, but I just gave you 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 and verse 2. Somebody read that real quick. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 and verse 2. This is how you identify who is the one literally that will be sitting on that throne when he comes back. Okay, again, the, the best thing you can do for interpreting the Bible is let the Bible interpret itself. We don't need opinions. We don't even need commentaries. The Bible is going to tell you what it's talking about the more and more you know about it. So go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and verse number 2, and that will identify the man sitting on the throne. And I suggest that any time you study the book of Revelation, you've got to know the Old Testament and the New Testament. You gotta know a lot of scripture to get revelation correct. Okay? Alright. Let's go, let's go to that then. What did I say? Second Timothy 4, verse 1 and verse number 2. Somebody read that for me, uh, please. This will show you who's sitting on that throne at that time. Typically, we focus in on verse 2, but really the emphasis tonight, because of the context of what we're talking about, is verse number 1, right? This is the Apostle Paul, uh, and he's instructing the young Timothy of how to lead in a ministerial role, right? And what is he saying to him? He said, one well, verse number 1, he says, what, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, I charge thee, means what? I command you, because why? God is talking through Paul, right? And so this is coming with the authority of God's word behind it. This is actually God talking through Paul. I charge thee therefore before God and the what? Lord Jesus Christ. Now, who is the subject then? Who's the last one mentioned? The Lord Jesus Christ. And with that being said, what is his function? Look at verse number one. What does it say after that? After you see the word, the Lord Jesus Christ, what does it say? Who judge. shall what? Judge. judge. So who specifically is the judge at the second coming? Jesus. Jesus Christ. The same one that was born in Bethlehem. The same guy that was raised in Nazareth, right? The same guy that went all over Judea and uh, Galatia, some parts of Samaria, right? The same guy that was crucified. The same guy that rose again from the dead on the third day and rose into heaven. 
and is seated at the right hand of God right now, as Brother Terry just said in Acts chapter number 2. So we're talking about that same Jesus, right? All right. And so what is his function? What did the Bible say? Judge. That he's going to judge the what? Quick. quick and the dead. Now remember, we don't use that word in English too much. Quick. Quick means what? Living. Living, right. He's going to be the judge of the what? The living and the dead, right? And so you're going to easily see that in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to verse number 17, right? Uh, remember, we studied in time gone by that the dead in Christ are going to be what? Rise again when he comes back, right? And those alive on earth are going to be what? Caught together with them in the clouds to be what? Forever with the Lord. And the only one that can make that happen is who? The judge of the quick and the dead. In other words, the judge of the living and the dead. You see how the scriptures do what? They harmonize with each other, right? If they don't harmonize, there's nothing wrong with the Bible. There's something wrong with your interpretation. Okay? All right. Because remember, God cannot lie. That means he cannot contradict himself. It's an impossibility. Okay? All right. Any questions or comments so far? All right, and we can pick out a whole lot of scriptures that talk about him judging and so forth and so on. So anytime you see this, when he talks about the Son of Man and will sit on his throne, who is Jesus really talking about? Himself. Himself. Okay? Remember, Son of Man was a messianic title given to us in the book of Daniel that talks about the Messiah, Lord and Christ, the Son of God, in other words. Okay? All right, any other questions or comments on that? All right. Here's the next point then that you learned. We just talked about that, but let's hit it one more time. John, just like Peter, remember we studied Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to verse number 13 on a previous class. What did Peter tell us was going to happen to the heaven and earth again? Yeah. You mean the earth and the sky? That's what that means? What's going to happen to it? Peter said what? It's going to burn up. It's going to be dissolved, is the words that he said, right? And take some serious heat to dissolve the earth and the sky and anything that you can see, right? And so if Peter said that, then John must be saying the same thing. Because remember, God's word don't what? It don't contradict itself. And so when John was saying in Revelation 20 that the heaven and the earth fled away, what is he really saying? Destroyed. They were destroyed. Okay, now what you'll learn about John's style of writing the Apostle John, it's called personification. Have you ever heard that word before? He'll take things and, and symbolically speak as if they're living creatures, right? Because the heavens and the earth can't literally have legs and go and run away. So that means what is he talking about? He's saying what? I'm talking in symbols, right? And so he personified what the heaven and the earth, as if they had were able to sprout legs and run away. That's another way of saying what? They're destroyed. They're gone. They're not coming back. Okay? All right? Any questions or comments on that? That clear to you? Because if you don't study it slow, you will mess up royally with Revelation. Okay? All right. And also, if you notice, those standing in front of Jesus are said to stand before God. See the harmonization of Scripture? Remember John 1, verse 1 to verse 3 and verse 14? What does the Bible say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says in John chapter 1, talking about Jesus, that the Word was made flesh, and what? Dwelt among us, right? Jesus even said, remember when the Jews wanted to kill him, he said, before Abraham was, I was. Am, right? right? And God said what to Moses back in Exodus? Amen. Remember we asked what he was supposed to tell people about God's name? What did God say? Amen. He said what? I Amen. am, right? All this talks about what? The divine status of Jesus. All right? And what is it called? The Is it the New World Bible? I can't remember the exact name. The Jehovah Witness Bible? New World? Got it right? All right. New World Translation, right? They changed John chapter 1, right? They rewrite it to fit their doctrine. And the only problem is they don't fix every scripture. 
In other words, if you're going to change one, you better change every last one of them, right? I can take their own body and show them that Jesus is the Son of God, even though they deny it. Even though they deny his divinity, I got some notes that I can give you later on that I can take their Bible and prove that Jesus is the Son of God and he is divine. They teach that he is not. Okay? But how can that be, right? You see, you don't have a, they don't have a good enough liar. No, I get what I'm saying. That's all right. <laughs> you see, every lie got a hold in it. <coughs> every lie ever told got a hold in it. Because if you study it long enough, you're going to find out when they didn't cover that part. It was almost like they're trying to bury your body over the foot still sticking out. See what I'm saying? That kind of thing. And so you can take their translation. Even though they tried to rewrite John chapter number one, they, they tried to rewrite it in the beginning of the word. And the word was with God and the word was a God. I wouldn't even do that anyway because that's true blasphemy. Not only change in the Bible itself is blasphemy, but saying he is a God. G-O-D means he's an idol. Now, what kind of nonsense? If you call yourself a godly person, then you're right in there that anything divine is an A, small letter G-O-D. That's crazy. That takes some boldness to do something like that. And then can't fix the rest of their Bible but make it sound right. Oh, boy, amen, somebody. Let me get him real quick. Go ahead. I was about to say before you mentioned that, that I had this discussion with the guy one time where he was saying that he was a God. Meaning, in other words, you could call it God, then that's what right. you're saying. So that's correct. The Bible also says there's one Lord, one God. Right. You know, so, and if he's a God, when you say that Jehovah God, the Father, the only, I mean, he, he's God and God alone, but then the Son of God or the false God, that's really what you're teaching. That's what that, that's what exactly what you're saying. Go ahead, I'll make sure I'm good job. It don't make no degree of sense. If you have any degree of common sense, you throw that away. If you have any degree of Bible knowledge, you throw that away, right? But again, what did the, 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 the prophet say in the Old Testament? My people perish because of lack of knowledge. knowledge. Satan takes advantage of ignorance. And what I mean by that is not the, the, the slang or the evil term by ignorance. I'm talking about when you don't know, you're easy fool. That's exactly what happens. And that's what's happening to people all the time. They don't have a Bible in them to back it up and to make sure that people don't take them off the direction that they don't need to be taken. Okay? All right. Any questions or comments on that? So even this, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, 15, also backs up all the biblical doctrines. I'm talking about Bible, not opinions or commentaries, that Jesus is also God also, that he is the son of God, meaning he's of the same divine stock as the Father, right? Okay. I mean, think about it now, and think about it from a common sense standpoint. You can't give birth to a dog. Why? Because you're a human. What do you do? You reproduce after your own kind. And if God has a son, he reproduced after his own kind. Right. So if God, if you can believe that God the Father is divine. You gotta believe that his offspring, Jesus, is also divine. Common sense, guys. Common sense. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments? Now don't let me talk all the time. I can do it now. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. It's so mixed up, you don't know what direction. You know, they, they, they don't know what direction they want to go. You know, it don't make sense. It's like they kind of want to say, okay, we're spiritual, but at the same time, we want to think in natural terms. And we want to put them together into one when you can't, right? Because why? The Bible is a supernatural book. So you have to think what? Supernatural. Beyond us, right? That makes sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments? But I get where you're coming from. Because if you don't believe Jesus is God, it's almost like being an atheist. You know, you divine, you deny his divinity. They do the same thing with the Holy Spirit. They deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit, right? But what was the problem with that? You know, all you got to do is go to Acts 5, verse 3, and verse number 4. 
when Ananias and Sapphira lied about their offering, what did Peter say to them, which was the Holy Ghost speaking through them? He said, what? You have not lied unto man, but have lied unto God. And he identified specifically who that was, the Holy Ghost. Okay? All right. So any other questions or comments? Very good. Very good. <coughs> All right. <coughs> know your Bible. You won't fall into these traps. All right. Let's go on then. And you know what's going back to Revelation 20, verse 11 and verse 15. All of mankind is seen as standing before Jesus for judgment, right? Every last one of them. So that means nobody's going to get out of the judgment. Like the old Monopoly game, there's no get out of jail free card. Everybody has to stand before who specifically? Jesus, right? Because who's the one sitting on the throne of Revelation 20? Jesus, right? The judge of the quick and the dead. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 and verse number 2. All right, so everybody, even when they don't believe in Jesus, and going back to your comment, you know, even the ones that say he ain't the Son of God, they're going to show see it for themselves. They're going to see him in his glory. They're going to see him in his regalia, if you want to call it. They're going to see him in his majesty, right? And he's going to say, what, well done? Now, good and faithful servant, or what? Depart from me. I know, I know, I know. Matthew 7, 21. You know, 23, right? Okay. All right, that's when he separated the sheep and the goat, Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46, right? And which one do you want to be, sheep or the goat? Jesus. Definitely the sheep, right? The ones on the right hand. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. All right, so obviously then he talked about several books, right? And the books are going to be, I'm talking about going back to Revelation 20, the standard of judgment. And of course, those books that first set got to be the Bible itself. How do I know this? Go back to John 12, 48. Now remember, what are we doing? We're letting the Bible interpret the Bible. And that way we don't get ourselves in trouble. Look at John 12, 48, somebody. Somebody read that for me, please. Let me get there with you first. Now I want to show you that the Bible interprets itself. All right. John 12, verse 38. And this has got to be coming from a miraculous man, right? Talking about Jesus Christ, right? Because he uttered these words over 2,000 years ago. And they're still going to be fulfilled, right? So it means he can see down the annals of time of what's actually going to happen and reveal that to us. All right, let's go to John. Chapter 12, verse 48. All right, somebody read that for me, please. Now remember, this is Jesus talking. The judge of the quick and the, the dead, right? All right, John 12, 48. Somebody read that for me, please. That rejected me and received not my word as one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. All right, so who's speaking again? Jesus. And he said, He that what rejected me, those that won't believe, that they won't obey him, all that kind of stuff, that stripping of his divinity, all that kind of stuff that we've been talking about, that means what? Rejecting him. Okay? And what is it saying? For he that rejected me and what? Receiveth not my words. Rejects what he tells them. And where is his words? The New Testament of the Bible, right? So if you reject the New Testament, there's nothing left to say to you. You get it? That's why a lot of folk all the time, they blaspheme the Holy Spirit all the time. Because why? The Holy Spirit calls this to be written. Right? And when you say the Bible is not true, the Bible is garbage. The Bible and all these insults people do, you know, stay away from the New Testament, Islam, that kind of stuff, then what are you really doing? You're rejecting Christ because they also say he's not the son of God. They also strip him of his divinity, right? So what are they doing? They're rejecting Jesus, right? What did Jesus say is the consequence of that? What did it say? Go back to John 12, verse 48. He says, what? He that what? Rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. What was his words? John 14, 6. We talk about every week. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, what? But by me. If you reject that, you have what? Rejected Jesus. You have rejected his words. And what's going to happen to you? John 12, verse 48 says what? He that rejected me and received not my words hath one that what? Yes. Judges yes. him. He also personifies something here. 
What did he personify? He said what? The word is going to judge them, acting as if the word itself is a person, right? It's the same concept that we're studying in Revelation number 20. The word that I have spoken, talking about Jesus, right? The same shall judge him in the last day. So that first book, of, uh, set of books in Revelation 20 that everybody's going to have to stand against is what? The Bible. The Bible itself. The word of Jesus Christ. Okay? All right? That makes sense to you. Still with me? All right, so you see that from John 12, verse 48. Because remember, who's doing all the talking in Revelation 20? And John, right? In John chapter 12, I'm saying. These are all rec records of the words of Jesus. Okay? All right. All right, now the other one that was mentioned, which I hope everybody in here want to be in, and hopefully you're already in it. Right? The other book that is going to be at the judgment day is called the what? Y'all know this. We sing about it, right? We celebrate about it, right? Our hope is contained in it, right? And that is called the what? The book of life, which is another way of saying what? The record of those who are saved. That will meet us also at the judgment day. You know, I don't know how that's going to go down. No man is going to know everything that God is going to do on that second coming day, the judgment day, how he's going to administer these things and all that kind of thing. So I'm talking out of my imagination right now. I want to be able to walk up there and be able to thumb through it, go to the ends. You know, if it's an alphabetical order, I want to see what? I want to see, I'm going to first look. I'm going to go N-O-L, okay? I ain't there yet, right? N-O-M, let me keep moving, N-O-R. N O R T, I still ain't there, right? N R R W, I'm gonna look at every last one and take my time back here, you know what I mean? And I won't see that Norwood. Like a, like a, what do you call it? Like those, uh, when you sign up those wedding registries, I won't see Norwood, comma, Anthony. Make sure he got it right, I won't see my middle initial L. <laughs> you got the right one now, Lord, it's, it's me. Let me on in here. But you know, that's, that's a silly way of saying that we all want our name. In that book, don't. If your name is not signed there, you're not going to make it in, right? It's almost like having an RSVP. If you don't have that reserve on earth, you can't get it later on, right? It's signed when you go down into that water grave of baptism, right? Because that's when you're added to the church, Galatians 3, verse 27, right? That's when your sins are washed away, Acts 22, verse number 16, right? And that's when God says he's going to save you, of course, if you stay faithful unto death. 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Mark 16, verse number 16, right? All of that, that's when your name is written in the book of life, right? The only one got that pen is Jesus. I can't write it in. You can't write it in either, can you? You know, I'm talking in symbols just like John's talking in symbols, right? You, no, no pastor can write it in. No matter how good he speaks, you know, no matter how long he's been in his pulpit, I didn't call it God's pulpit, I called it his pulpit, right? Because whatever's coming out of his mouth is his, if it ain't God's, right? Amen. He can't put you in, nobody's opinion can put you in. It has to be signed, symbolically speaking, by the what? Pen of Jesus himself. Okay? That makes sense to you. All right. So celebrate. You know, if you're a saved child of God, it's your name is already written in the book of life and will meet you there on that judgment day. All right? Look at first, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 3. And I'm going to tell you, people may not understand this, but God is already talking about 2,000 years ago. Some folks' his name is already there. So that means he writes it before you get there. Okay, that makes sense? All right, look at Philippians 4, verse number 3. This is Paul, the inspired apostle, uh, revealing the word of God through the Holy Spirit. And what did he say here? Somebody read that for me, please. Philippians 4, verse number 3. All right. Those folks lived 2,000 years ago or so, right? right. Died 2,000 years ago, right? And God said what? Where's their name already? It's in the book of life. So God signs it immediately when he saves you. 
Is that a beautiful thing? Beautiful, beautiful. And notice something now. He said what? Help those women too, right? That's good, right? That means the lady's going to be there, right? Yeah. With Clement also, which is a guy, and with what? Other of my fellow laborers whose names are what? Written, are in, that is, the book of life. Amen, somebody. Amen. So if their names is there, you a saved child of God, your name is there along with them, aren't you? That's all right then. And see, I'm not going to complain. You know, I don't know what Clement's last name, if he had one, but I'm after him. <laughs> I'm going to a seat. <laughs> I'm all right, all right, Lord, just let me in. I don't care. Clement can go before me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> me and him will have a good time anyway. Is that all right? <laughs> just let me in. That's all I care about. <laughs> With all this said and done. I, like I tell people all the time, I say to my wife, I, I, I hope God got a sense of humor. I hope he's saying that boy is just so crazy. He keeps talking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. Any questions or comments? All right, let's move on. Now remember these things I'm telling you my imagination. I hope don't take for Bible. Don't take for Bible. All right. The other part that was mentioned here is that the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the dead will raise the dead within the entire plane, no matter how or where they die. That matters none, right? Think about it. That's why people get so bent out of shape over uh, cremation. It doesn't matter because your body is going to return to the dust anyway. It's just faster when you go through cremation. Remember, if God can take dust and breathe the breath of life in it and make it a living soul like he did with Adam, don't you think he can do that? So it doesn't matter how you die, body mutilated, missing an arm or a leg, don't worry about that stuff. Because what? God got all that stuff under control. He is sovereign. He can do anything. So think about that now. That, that may be why... Uh, John started talking about even the dead is going to give up. You know, I mean, even the uh, seas are going to give up the dead, right? You know, those people have been lost forever down there. But God is going to go exactly where he know they at, right? And what? Raise them up, right? There's more seas and there's land any day of the week, right? That's when people are lost to sea sometimes. They truly lost. Because there's more water than there is earth, you know, that we can step on, okay? So even that won't be a barrier to the resurrection, okay? And that, these are the type of things that they're talking about. And again, when you look at the way John writes again, he personified death. He made death as if death was a person, right? As if death was holding mankind hostage, and so what God is saying is that what? He's going to overpower death. And what? Everybody's going to rise again. Okay? Make sense? You starting to understand John's writing style? He does that quite a bit. He personifies a lot of things that aren't actually people, but acts as if they are. Okay? Any questions or comments so far? Still with me? I'm trying to get there, but Revelation 20, verse 7 to 15 is so deep. A lot to it. I don't think I might even get through all the slides on Revelation 20 tonight. That's okay. We don't need to rush it. We want to get understanding before anything, right? All right. Now, here's where I want to go. He personified hell, too. Now, remember, when you use the King James Version, you have to look up the Greek word for hell, right? Remember, there's more than one Greek word uh, for hell in the King James Version of the Bible. More contemporary versions don't translate every Greek word as the word hell as the King James Version does. Now, you might be asking, well, why they do it that way? I cannot tell you to save my life. All I know is that King James had 70 scholars, and for some reason they decided to translate every Greek word that talks about the afterlife as hell. But we've come to a greater understanding where we can actually interpret the Greek ourselves. And so there's more than one word, right? The two I just want to stick with, there's more than just these two, but I want to stick with uh, would be Hades. Remember we talked about Hades in the past? Yeah. And we talked about Gehenna, right? And what's the difference between the two? Hades is the one you go to immediately after death, and Gehenna is the one you go to on the judgment 
today. I have an illustration if we get to it that you'll be able to see what we're talking about from a visual standpoint, from the Bible itself, right? And so remember, Hades is a place of all the dead, okay? So all the souls of man after we die go to Hades. And remember, there's two sections of Hades. One is paradise, paradise and the other is the only other name you have is Tartarus, right? And obviously, I hope you don't want to go to Tartarus, because Tartarus is the evil place, right? It's the place of torment until the judgment day, and then you get your butt whooped again in Gehenna forever. So you never get any peace after you die if you don't die in the Lord. You don't die safe. Okay, it makes sense to you. So everybody wants to go where Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's the good section of Hades, which is the what? The place of all the dead. Okay? That makes sense to you? you know, I, I, we've studied the past. I didn't want to elaborate too much on that, but I think you get it. So Hades is where the soul of the dead mankind are, where they await the judgment day. Okay? All right. Let me keep going because I want to try to get through this as much as I can. I may not. Let me see how much more I have to do. Now we ain't getting through it all. Too much debt. But let's just complete the thought then. All right. So Hades is the place of the righteous and unrighteous dead. And again, it has what? Two sections, right? Let's look at that for a minute. Go to Luke 23, 43. I want to make sure you don't think I'm teaching Norwoodisms. Luke 23, 43. This is the Bible. So here's the two places you go to after death, immediately after death. Let's put it that way. In Luke 23, 43, and other, other passages you show the same thing. I'm just trying to expedite things and get you to a certain place. Luke 23, verse 43. Somebody read that for me, please. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. All right. So today was the day that what? Jesus and the thief on the cross died. And Jesus told him exactly where they were going. Where was it? Paradise. To paradise. He didn't say heaven, as people say at every funeral. He didn't say that. I'm talking about the final destination of heaven. He did not say that. He said they're going where? To paradise. They're two different places. They're not the same. You'll see that in a minute. All right? Any questions or comments on that? All right. Now, Tartarus is where the evil angels are who are already being punished. Remember, when Satan led a rebellion in heaven, it wasn't just him that rebelled. It was his, him and his folks. The angels that decided to follow Satan, they also were punished by God. Okay? Now, Satan is not in Hades right now. He's in the earth. Okay? I don't have time to talk about that right now. But some of his henchmen have already been assigned to the bad area of Hades, which we call Tartarus in the Greek. That reason of Greek All right, so let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. I know this is very foreign to a lot of people. It took me a long time to catch on to it myself. When I first heard it, I could not process it. So I had to keep uh, keep reading it because we're taught we, we, we're taught a lot, you know, in our society through culture, through tradition, that when somebody died, they go either to heaven or hell. That ain't the truth. It's not the truth. They actually go to paradise or they go to Tartarus. All right, Second Peter chapter two, verse number four. Somebody read that for me, please. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. All right, so that tells you what Hades is. Think about this now. There were some angels that sinned, right? We call them demons in our own language, right? Yeah. They decided to follow Satan instead of God. Okay? And so what did God do to them? He said, for God spared not the angels, so he punished them. Right? The angels that rebelled against him, he did what? He punished them, right? That would mean that's what he's saying, that he didn't spare them. He had no mercy upon them because angels are like human beings, not flesh and blood. But what I mean by that is they have their own free will. 
Some decided to be good. And just like man, some decided to be evil. Okay? All right. And so what happened to them? For God spared not the angels that what? Sin. Sin. So obviously there was a standard of judgment for them too. They knew right and wrong, but they decided to what? Transgress the law of God. They what? Sin. And so what happened to them? It said what? They were cast them down to hell. That word hell in the original Greek is the word tar. Tartarus. Tartarus. That's where they went. Okay? All right. And did what? Deliver them into chains of darkness. Darkness was an ugly place down there. Remember, no sunlight, no light, no, no anything. And they're, they're bound there where they can't get out. All right? And why did God put them in Tartarus? To be reserved for judgment. Okay? All right, so they're in the waiting area too, but it ain't a good waiting area, right? It's a place in which they are tormented to get another punishment that's going to come on the judgment day. That's why you see, I'm not going to have time to get to it, when you look at Revelation 20, verse, uh, when you look at Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15, is it right here? Yes, this is what I'm going to get to. Hades also must give up all its dead on the judgment day. So on the judgment day, all those souls are going to be released. You get it? This is the hard part of Christianity. This is the adult level of Christianity. Some will go on to what? Eternal life. And some will go on to what? Eternal damn nation. Okay? So that shows you that there's an in-between area. You see? That everybody, excuse me, everybody is reserved for judgment. That's good for some and bad for others. Okay? So to be reserved means what? You're waiting for something, right? If you go to a restaurant and you have what? Reservations, what are you doing? You're waiting for the table, right? You can't say, I'm in the restaurant and so now I'm eating. That's what we do, right? You died, so you went to heaven. That's skipping a step. You get, you get the analogy that I'm giving you, right? You can't skip the step. First, you got to go to what? Hades, which is going to be what? Either paradise or Tartarus. Okay? And hopefully, we all going to be on that what? That paradise side of Hades. Okay? All right. So notice now. It said, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So that means on the judgment day, two places are going to be destroyed. What are the two places God going to destroy? The heaven and earth, which is our realm, mm -hmm. and he's also going to destroy the what? The place of the dead mm -hmm. that they're waiting on. So that means it still exists. The place of the dead still exists right now. Okay? All right? That makes sense to you? Because remember, he's talking the future, right? That death and hell, the Greek word Hades, are going to be what? Cast into the lake of fire. So he's personifying them as if they're human beings, right? And so he's going to destroy them too, okay? So God is only going to have one realm left. And what is that realm going to be? Heaven or hell as we know it. Hell being the Greek word Gehenna. All right, did that go over your head? You still with me? All right, I think you still with me, right? All right, so at that judgment day, then that means from when I when I say death, nobody's gonna die. I mean by we're all gonna exist still, just not going to be in the state you want if you're not saved, right? Or you're gonna exist in eternal bliss, joy, which would be heaven. Okay. All right, makes sense to you? All right, any other questions or comments on that? I think we'll have to end here. Time is up. Because we didn't exactly finish all of that. But we'll, we'll come back to uh, Revelation 12. We can. If y'all got two minutes, I'll finish it off. You good with two minutes? Yeah. All right. And then you can take the whole teaching back home to yourself in Revelation 20. All right. So God abolishing death is a great thing for the Christian and part of the promise of heaven. And I quote this a lot every Sunday. 
What is heaven going to be like? Revelation 21, verse number 4. And God shall what? Wipe away all tears from their eyes. That means, obviously, sadness can exist, right? Because tears are the result of sorrow that we go, down, go through, that is, in this earthly life, right? And there shall be no more what? Death. Why? What did he say? Death. What's going to happen to death in the earlier passage of in Revelation 20? He says it's going to be cast into the lake of fire. So that process of death will no longer exist. Okay? In the afterlife. Neither sorrow, which goes with what? Wipe away tears from the eyes, right? There'll be nothing in heaven that can bring us down. It's going to always be joy, in other words, right? No crying, it all adds up. It all is the same thing. Neither shall it be what? No more pain. Again, isn't it beautiful that you can clear out your medicine closet? Huh? No CVS pharmacy, Walgreens pharmacy, no hospital. I'm looking at her, no therapy. You know what I mean? Because she's grabbing the net now. You get where I'm coming from? You won't have to worry about those things because God said what? For the former things are what? Passed away. Their time expires when earth expires. When Jesus comes back, you don't have to worry about any of that. No insulin medicine. No hypertension medicine. None of that nonsense, right? Because God said he's not going to allow that to exist in the afterlife. Okay? I'm, I'm going through quickly. So again, Hades will also be abolished, which means that the dead go to their final destination, which is heaven or hell as we know it. That's what we're really talking about. When we're, when we're saying that somebody's in heaven or hell, Gehenna meaning the final destination. Okay? And of course, hell is described as the what? Lake of fire. Now remember John the Baptist, long before Revelation was written, he said in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 11, and I'll let you get that on your own time because we're out of time, that some folk will be baptized in fire. So you better leave the Pentecostal assemblies alone. Mm -hmm. Leave the apostolic stuff alone. I've been baptized in fire. No, you have not. You wouldn't be here. Because mm -hmm. when God is talking about baptism in fire, he ain't talking about getting excited. He's talking about what? Being, he's talking about Revelation 20. Verse 11 and 15 being what? Dip in the lake of fire. fire. And so, you know, they, they had that going on a lot. I watch a lot of Nigerian stuff. And they, one of the things they do all the time is, Holy Ghost fire! <laughs> well, you better get away from it. Amen. Because you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> huh? They do that stuff like, Holy Ghost fire! 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 And folks are falling out. And they try to run the scriptures like this and all that to prove it. Now, you don't know what you just said. You saying Holy Ghost send me to hell? Oh, oh amen. Let me leave it alone. Let me leave it alone. They might not be able to process that. But that's what I'm saying. That's what ignorance does to you. You start claiming and asking for stuff that's bad for you instead of good for you. Okay. All right. Only those names written in the book of life to be saved. Y'all know that, right? And it means that those who have Jesus as their Lord and Savior without hypocrisy are the ones that's going to make it to that heavenly glory we always talk about. Right? That's what Romans 8 verse 1 says. There is therefore now no condemnation. Condemnation means what? Judgment against. And there's no condemnation. There, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are what? In Christ. To be in Christ means what? Galatians 3 verse number 27 says what? Those who have been baptized have been what? Baptized into Christ. That's when you're a Christian. That's when you're a child of God. And that's when you're saved. That's why Jesus can save. You harmonize the scripture like you're supposed to. Those that are bad. There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ, which are baptized into Christ. Who walk not after the flesh, meaning that you're not being evil, you're really being a sincere Christian, right? But after the what? Spirit. spirit, meaning capital S spirit, the Holy Spirit, what he has written in the Bible, New Testament. If you go by those, you're in Christ, and there's no judgment against you. That's basically what it's saying. All right. So next week, then, we're going to talk about Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and you're going to hear a lot of repetition. And you're supposed to hear repetition, don't you? Every time we talk about the second coming, it should be the same story. 
Otherwise, we lie, because God cannot lie. All right, let, let one of the brothers take us out here with a song real quick, and that'll get us back organized, and we'll go from there. Good class. God bless you. Victory will hail.